it's good to be back here at my home church at the main campus. Um, I'm really excited to bring God's word this morning. Thank you again, Pastor Mike, for allowing me this time. Um, so, Happy New Year, right? We're two days away from the big day. Crazy. So, with that in mind, thinking about the new year coming, I want to ask you, have you ever have you ever had to do something or had something happen that had you so stressed out that you just couldn't cope? I mean, something so scary, you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach that just keeps you up at night. How did you get through it? Right, how did you deal with that? I think it's fair to say that probably all of us have gone through something, some crisis in our life that that uh, just brought us immense agony. And probably, being human, we all dealt with it a little bit differently, didn't we? And maybe some of us dealt with it head on. Some of us are hard chargers, right? No surrender, no retreat, dealing with it head on. But then there's some of us that may have retreated because they thought that was the better option. You know, maybe you were just in a, a place in your life where, you know, I just can't, I just can't handle this right now. Right? It's in, during these times of crisis that we're flooded with all kinds of emotions. And the Bible is full of people who at different times have gone through agonizing situations or faced pain. Right, imagine the agony that Abraham felt when he had to, was told to sacrifice his son Isaac. Or remember the agony or the sorrow that David must have felt when his son Absalom died because of, his, of David's sin. Right, and I can't even begin to fathom the agony that Job must have went through. And all of these people experienced a type of agony or pain and suffering. But some would say that nothing compares, nothing in the Bible compares to the agony and the anguish that Jesus felt the night he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So if you will, open your Bibles to the book of Mark, to chapter 14. We're going to read verse 32. We're going to start there. If you don't have a Bible, well, the ushers are great. We have Bibles available. Just raise your hand, and one of the ushers will bring you one. And if you're brand new here and you don't own a Bible, it's your gift. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Now, going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping. Again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. And returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. So if you've spent any time following Jesus' ministry, right, we, we, we've seen him tired, 
We've seen him hungry. We've seen him thirsty, sad, right? And we've even seen him lash out in anger in the temple square. But that night in Gethsemane, we see something completely different. Right? We see a change. We see a side of Jesus that we've not seen before. Catch you up, Jesus, right? Jesus and the 12 had finished the Last Supper, the Passover meal, right? Judas had got up and left so that he could go get the Pharisees and betray Jesus. And Jesus and the remaining 11, they head out to the Mount of Olives. And when they get to the garden, Jesus instructs the disciples, he says, sit here while I pray. Now this would have appeared normal, right, because it's very common for Jesus to go off and pray by himself. But see, in that moment, something different happened. This time, he took Peter, John, and James with him. And he took those three. Those were his most trusted disciples, right? It was the three of them that were chose to witness the rising, uh, raising to life of Jairus' daughter. It was Peter, James, and John that were there at the transformation of Jesus, the transfiguration. And these three disciples would have had a far better understanding of the gravity of this pain and agony that Jesus was going through. And they would have been able to offer comfort to their Lord and their friend. So he takes the three and he says to them, stay here and keep watch. But why do you think he asked them to keep watch? Stay here and keep watch. See, he didn't mean for them to watch for the guards. Right? He, he, he knew what was going to happen. He purposely went to the garden because that was a familiar place. It's a place he often went. It was a place that Judas would have known where to find him. You see, Jesus wasn't trying to avoid capture. Rather, he was preparing for it. So he wasn't saying to them, hey, guard against, watch for people that are coming for me. Because he knew he had to be arrested. Right? The time had come. But he says, stay here and keep watch. Watch what I do. And then Jesus goes off a little further, and he falls to the ground. And that's where he prays. And he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Abba, Father, God, as my Father, take this cup. Right? Take this hour, this, this situation, this fate. Take it away. See, we're used to seeing Jesus pray, but here he's exposing his inner soul, his complete and utter agony on what was about to happen. And we read this, and, and we assume that Jesus may be having second thoughts about going to the cross and everything that he was about to go through. Right? We, we know that he went through the beatings and the ridicule he was spat upon. Beaten, almost unrecognizable. And while the human side of Jesus, there might be a little truth in that. There was something far more important to Jesus. More heavy on his mind. I mean, make no mistake, he knew what was coming. But as humans, we tend to look at the outside of things. The big, we just look at what we see, the snapshot. But Jesus looked at the inside, the heart of the matter. See, he knew not only was he about to take on the guilt for the sins of the world, but he was going to actually become that sin. Right? This perfect lamb, this unblemished, innocent lamb was about to bear the weight of the world's sin upon himself. 
And when that happened, he knew that he would be banished from God's presence. Because sin cannot exist in the presence of God. We just came out of a series, The Prophetic Visions of a Coming King. And probably several weeks ago, Pastor Mike or Pastor Ryan or would have preached on Isaiah chapter 6. Remember when Isaiah went into the temple, into the presence of God, and remember what happened. He, he, he was so scared. He sees the presence of God and he cries out, woe is me. And the, the funny thing is that doesn't do it justice. Woe is me, I got a flat tire. Right, he's like, are you kidding me? Oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to be wiped out. I'm going to be erased. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I, and I live with people with unclean lips. I'm not going to survive in the presence because I'm a sinner. I'm full of sin. And that's what was breaking the heart of Jesus. Because he knew he was going to be separated from his father. God couldn't bear seeing his son as sin. See, and that's the message that Jesus wanted the disciples to hear. Take this cup. If there's any other way to, to, to save these people, to get rid of this sin so I don't have to be separated from you, God, my Father, for even one minute. But the disciples didn't get that message because they were sleeping through it. And Jesus came back and he, was, he said, Simon, what are you doing? Right, and if you read the Gospels, you know that when, when Jesus calls Peter Simon or Cephas, he's upset. You ever notice that? When he's happy, it's Peter. But when, he's, when, when Peter's done something wrong, it's Cephas or Simon. What is wrong? You, can you not even stay awake for one hour? Keep watch and pray. So you have to be prayed up to avoid the temptation that is coming. He says, sure, your spirit's willing to follow me. Your intentions are good, but unfortunately, your flesh is weak. And you are about to be in the middle of something huge, and I need you to be on your game. So what Jesus was, was trying to tell them is, number one on your notes, we need to pray to prepare for what is ahead. See, Jesus wanted them to learn something. Right When he returned to them and found, and found them sleeping, he said, watch and pray so that you're not going to fall into temptation. But there was a lesson there. And we, we find out what that lesson was three days later on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appears to the three and, and he's speaking of his suffering and his death and, and he asks them, he says, wasn't it necessary? But he says, did the Messiah not have to suffer these things, then enter his glory? See, what the disciples were supposed to see and learn that night was that the connection between suffering and transformation and the necessity of being willing to go through all of the tension, right, all of the disappointment, all of the unfairness of the situation without giving in to anger and bitterness or the urge for retaliation. But they slept through it. And we know they slept through it and they didn't get it because when Judas arrived with the mob, right, what happened? Peter drew his sword and he cut off the ear of Malchus, didn't he? See, Peter thought, I'm revolting against the Jewish leadership, but in actuality, he was revolting against Jesus and what he was trying to teach them. He 
second. Number two, so we pray for others because it shows we truly care about them. See, in that time, Jesus wanted the care and support of his friends. I mean, Jesus was God incarnate, right? Did he really need the disciples to pray for him? Praying for someone is an act of love. It's an act of friendship, and it shows we really care for one another, for that person. I mean, if it wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't have come back three times. He would have come back the first time, found him sleeping, and said, worthless. I was going to take care of this myself. But imagine the encouragement that Jesus might have drawn from them if he had come back and actually found them wide awake and praying, praying for him and praying with him. I mean, think about it. It's the same for us, right? When we pray for others, we come alongside them. Metaphorically, we, we, we link arms together with them. And it doesn't matter how far apart we are. We could be continents away from each other. But we can still be there side by side with that person, walking through that situation with them, providing them the prayers and encouragement that they need. I mean, think of how at peace you are when, when some big something is happening in your life and you know that you have a body of believers behind you praying for you and encouraging you. Right last week, Pastor Mike came up here and shared with the, how, how much peace his family and, and he felt when, when this church and, and people all over the country that know Pastor Mike and his family were praying for his dad. And there's something else that Jesus wanted them to get by praying that night. See, praying for others helps to strengthen yourself. What? See, when you pray for others, your prayers strengthen yourself. It puts you in the presence of God. I think it's nearly impossible to intercede on, on others' behalf without deriving some benefit for yourself. It's like when Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he was doing, he was, it was more than an observation. I think he was throwing a little grace in there. He was saying, the spirit's willing. Look, I know you want to do what's right. I know you have the best intentions at heart. But the flesh is weak. Right? Your will to sin is strong, stronger than you realize. And right now, I need you to focus on my Father. Cover yourselves with the armor of God. Because think about it. When you're praying, right, when you're in your quiet place and you're in front of the Lord and you're giving him your all and, and I'm praying intently and I am focused on him, I don't sin. Right, my habits, no matter what they might be, disappear. They fade away. Because I'm focused on him. See, Jesus was in so much distress and agony because of what he was about to go through that it caused him to actually sweat blood. Right? That's a real thing called hemotidrosis. Where the, you get so nervous that the capillaries, it, it, they swell and they burst. And it, and it mixes the blood in your sweat. You actually sweat blood. Right in the Gospel of Luke, Dr. Luke says, and being in anguish, in being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus prayed earnestly that God would take that cup from him. He was obviously in agony and in anguish. If there's any other way that humanity could be saved so that Jesus would not have to be abandoned by his father. But regardless of, of how 
agonized he was over what was about to come, he never tried to bend his father's will. Even though the thought of becoming sin and being absence from the presence of God so completely overwhelmed Jesus that he, he said to the point of death, he surrendered to his father's will. So number four, when we pray, we pray God's will, not our will be done. When we're faced with something big, something we don't want to do in the midst of our biggest fears, when we cry out to God, when we, when we have to pray, when we pray to our Father in heaven, we have to remember those words. And we should include them, yet not what I will, but what you will. And I know when, when we're in those situations, it's hard for us to remember that it's ultimately his will, not our will. See, I know I tend to forget that. When I'm facing that mountain and I can't move it, right, and I get frustrated and I try and I try and I keep trying and, and, and I say, I got this. And I'm pretty sure Jesus is standing over here going, yeah, no, you don't. But he's going to let me keep trying and he gets me run around like a crazy man until I finally crash and burn and I reach my, my breaking point. And I feel completely defeated. And when I finally turn to him and I scream, help! But it's only when I've completely surrendered to his will that I hear his voice that says, Ron, I got this. So what an opportunity Peter, James, and John missed on that fateful night. They were truly distracted by so many things. I mean, Jesus was right there with them and everything that he had taught them over the past three years, in that moment, they missed it. You know, sometimes life's going to come at us hard. And we're going to suffer. And there's going to be things that we're going to go through that are hard. And, and things that we don't like. And things that we don't want to do. And when that happens, we have to pray and keep watch. Because those times are always a lesson. And praying keeps, keeps us focused on what's truly important. And even if the outcome Man, if it's not the outcome we hoped for, so we can have peace in knowing that it was God's will. Paul told the Roman church, right in Romans 12, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And don't let the distractions of life get you down. Don't let it pull you away from there. See, the problem here is we used to hold this up here. God, I've done this. So it's a reminder that, man, let this renew your mind. Let it transform you. Because then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good perfect and pleasing will. I mean, to know that we're going to endure pain and suffering or hardships for a season, sometimes for longer than that, it can be overwhelming. And I wish I could stand here and say, you know what, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, your life is going to be perfect. You're never going to have pain. You're never going to have sorrow. You're going to have money up the wazoo. It's going to be beautiful. But really, folks, that'd be a lie. Because that's not true. But what we know through this 
right, is that through sacrifice, it brings transformation. And we can find comfort in knowing that if we follow him, right, if we seek him, if we surrender to his will, we can be transformed, right, by the saving power of Jesus Christ. And we'll be rewarded with a place in his kingdom, in his presence, forever and ever. Amen? See, when we stop for a minute, we remember what Jesus went through. So we would have this opportunity, a future with no pain and no suffering, and a chance to be in the presence of him. Then we see the good, pleasing perfectness of all of this. So with this new year approaching, and with the chance of a pain or agony that life may throw at us, I just urge you to pray and keep watch with Him. Like the song we sang earlier, oh, what an amazing Be intentional about spending time with him and let his words transform you. Because remember, the spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. And I want to close with this, James. You know, James said, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Flee. 